Nine. The Meeting. Overwhelmed, I must have slept four hours the entire night. The rest of the night I laid staring at the ceiling, excited about the following day's events. My adrenaline was already rising. I couldn't wait to get started. The beginning of simulations always got my blood pumping. This was no different. All I could dream about was racing into a building after my target. The anticipation had turned into something far more. A drug I had to keep pumping into my veins to function. The darkness of the room gradually changed and light came through the pale curtains of the window, spreading across the wooden floor of my bedroom until it touched my bed and made me blink away from its bright and warm embrace. I rose, showered, and came to stand in front of the mirror, clearing the glass of the misty fog. Bright emerald eyes stared back from the other end of the mirror, mirroring the excitement I felt. I smiled, recalling the ease it took to slip back into the teenage appearance. Joseph's words mocked me each time. Easy on the eyes. I pushed back wet, brown, blonde locks. My hair was so thick it took shape with little help from my long fingers. My eyes traced several scars on my chest, sustained over my short period as a hunter and that of a cadet. It took a few moments to remember the story that would explain all the marks on my body. The car accident that had dislocated my arm and had cut quite a large scar on my side. There were football injuries. Some of the scars I remembered getting. Knife wounds, gunshots, a graze here, a bullet hole there. But others might as well have been divvied out from their fictional beginnings. The only ones to ever ask about the scars and need an elaborate explanation were the girls when we were together. Guys were easier to appease. If I said car accident, I didn't have to say anything else. I brushed my teeth, added cologne, and grabbed the costume that would finish off the look of a high school senior. Dressed in a silk pastel blue shirt with the sleeves rolled up to my elbow, and a gray vest buttoned all the way. I stared over at the faded jeans sitting on the shelf. They seemed to go better with the top than the dress slacks Joseph had left for me. They were faded to look rough and worn, but they came right off the department store shelf. Joseph would be surprised and would have to rethink his dress order when getting my apparel from now on. A little variety was good. On the floor was a backpack and a brown, genuine leather satchel. I almost missed it laying against the side of the closet. I thought about taking the satchel, but grabbed the backpack instead. This would complete my look. The previous social media accounts began a few years ago by the company were no longer operational. My identity could no longer be compromised. So further, were discontinued. Many asked why I didn't have one, especially the girls. The only excuse that had not failed me was my father. He didn't approve of them. I hadn't given girls much thought. I always had too much to do. I found them appealing, lovely, delicate creatures who smelled good and were soft to the touch. But I knew it would never last. They liked being held and protected by me. My last girlfriend begged to come away with me after graduation. I hated what I had to do to persuade her she couldn't. She was determined to leave everything behind to be with me. You would leave everything for me? I had asked her. Aren't you afraid? No. When I'm with you, you make me feel safe. We can start over together. I can get a job as a waitress or at your uncle's company. I cringed when she'd said that. I didn't want to break her heart. I couldn't do it. She was innocent, and I was something different. At least that's what Joseph had said. You're a good kid, John. Deep down inside, you have a sweet spot. The mission had ended, and I had yet to give my phone to my guardian for disposal. She'd called before I could. It rang in the most embarrassing of all places, Dr. Nicholson's office. We were getting debriefed, handing over our reports and observations. I was an idiot for having it on. I meant to switch it off. He immediately motioned for me to give him the phone, lifting a single finger to hand it to him. He took it and deactivated the phone with the device he inserted into the charging port. It went dead immediately. You'd avoid such distractions if you followed protocol and handed Joseph your equipment at the end of your assignment. 
He gave Joseph the phone, who immediately took it and placed it into the briefcase he carried. Dr. Nicholson narrowed his eyes right at me. Let this be the last time you disregard procedure. There was nothing I could say. He was right. Putting on the watch, I said it as I always did during the beginning days of a mission. I grabbed the devices on the top of the desk and dropped them into the backpack and came out of the room. I wasn't surprised to see Joseph when I came down the stairs and set the contents of the envelope on the counter. He was dressed for the job in a dark blue striped suit with coordinating gray striped tie finishing his attire. Streaks of blonde highlights shone through the dark brown slicked back nest of hair. He had it styled like a professional businessman. Golden brown skin made him look flawless and youthful. Joseph was in his early thirties, but he acted a lot older. I guess it made sense with him having seen a lot more than I had. Hey, I got the equipment, I said, setting the backpack onto the counter. He was eating an apple when he turned. His full lips curved into a grin despite being occupied with the piece of apple he was chewing. Good morning, nephew. There was a bowl of fake apples on the counter, which were green. Joseph was eating a red one. He swallowed, licking his lips where apple juice had dripped out of the corner of his mouth. He wiped at it with the back of his hand. Good. We should head out. We're expected. Make sure you're updated on your identity. I know the drill, Joseph. I've done this before, I said. Don't get cocky, kid, he said, chewing on his apple. My plan was to head to class, but since Joseph was here, I had to tag along. Things had changed. I would have to accompany him instead of getting into the routine and work. The director sent me an update. His eyes drifted toward me. As you are aware, I have been transferred. And you and I are moving in with dear old dad. I nodded, glancing at him and waiting for the update he was referring to. Since your father, he continued looking around, opening the pantry and found the trash, dropping the apple remains into it, doesn't use this house a lot. He's invited us to stay there. Right. I blinked at him. But also because your grandma died recently. I nodded at the added info. Yours, I, I mean your pretend grandma, he reassured. I gave him a look. Why would I think it was my actual grandma? I didn't have one. That's the update, Joseph added. Well, not an update, but it's worth mentioning. Great. Considering the contents of the mission and documents I had just spent hours reading, the grandma thing was a nice touch. Joseph laughed, the laughter of a man who was enjoying seeing me soaking in the new information. Relax, hotshot. Dr. Nicholson figured a sympathetic story would help you connect with the Edwards' granddaughter. He wanted you to be aware. It works with what communications I've been having with Mr. McClellan. It was the story I gave him, so it's all good, Joseph winked. I furrowed my brow at him. Hey, anything helps, right? He grinned. She lost her parents and grandfather. You lost your nana and mother two years earlier, he laughed. If you ask me, you have a lot in common now. I grabbed the cell phone from inside my backpack. There was a message from Dr. Nicholson regarding updates. Joseph smiled. I know it's not the same, but it might be what you need to connect with her. Just remember you were close. Poor Grandma Mueller. She will be greatly missed. He laughed before straightening himself to look into the stainless steel refrigerator. Dr. Nicholson thought it would further explain your absence from classes. Our death in the family, the move, those sorts of things. I got it. He glanced back. There was no doubt in his eyes. I was ready. We just want to cover our bases, so... He said, stepping up to me. A big smile spread over his mouth. He looked me up and down. Not bad. Not bad at all. His eyes rolled off every part of my attire, like the staff sergeant did when he was making sure I was standing at attention. I thought it was strange he was just noticing, but realized he had. It was just taking him a moment to offer his opinion. Jeans, huh? He smirked. They go with the vest and shirt nicely. It's nice to see you've learned to dress yourself. You make me proud.
I twisted my lip. Funny, I muttered. He laughed. Looking sharp, nephew. Girls won't know what hit him. He gave me a thumbs up. I'm wondering, how do you manage to keep him off? Was he joking at my expense again? Keep them off? A frown greeted back from my face. I'm not there to socialize, Joseph. I'm sure you've had a girlfriend, right? Of course, I said. Many. I didn't want to make it sound like that. I had taken a few to prom, kissed them, never felt right about being with them. I just don't have time for them or what they want from me, Joseph. I'm committed to the job, that's all. Joseph fell silent. Wondering if he had hit a delicate nerve, he softened, his expression taking on a more caring, nurturing note. I had no time for anything else. The only thing that drove me was the high and adrenaline I got from the hunt. You shouldn't be afraid to love anyone, kid, he said suddenly. Where had that come from? Joseph, I have no time for anything else. What would you have me do, lie to them when I'm only going to leave? I don't love anything but my job. That's what keeps me going, and I'm happy with that. You worry me, kid. You're still young. You should be... He stopped himself. You're forgetting your place, Joseph. I understood he was my guardian, and also, yes, a friend. He shook his head. No, no, of course not. You're right. We have a job to do. You have a job to do. I exhaled. Forget it, I'm just talking out of my ass. I didn't say anything. Joseph had become very comfortable and friendly with me since the start of our relationship. Sometimes he spoke the first thing that popped into his head. I guess you could say we had a very easygoing friendship. So just to clarify, Grandma Mueller's dead, he said. Our discussion forgotten. We had a funeral a few days ago, etc., your dad's a workaholic, blah. He searched the cabinets, pulling open the drawers and cabinetry from each end of the kitchen. They were all empty. Didn't he know there was never any food in a destination house? That's why it was a destination house. No one ever stayed any longer after assigned their assignment. I observed him for a minute. What are you doing? I felt I had to say. Is there no food in this house? He uttered. You know there's never any food in a destination house. He grunted. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was hoping someone had left a protein shake or something. I shook my head. Never mind. So, you're ready? I nodded. 